as with um, a lot of things, this started out as a side project. And now um, I have a PhD student working on it. I have two undergraduates working on it. Um, and it's kind of ballooned into this thing that takes up about 80% of my time. And um, it all started when I was out doing field work with my lab manager, um, Forrest Palmer, who actually did his master's with Jerome Grant at Tennessee. Um, and Dave Coyle, who a lot or most of you probably know, he's, a, he's the extension side of assistant professor of Forest Health at Clemson, and he's been here uh, just as long as I have. And so we were out doing pollinator stuff at mimosa trees, not even related, and we're walking back to the truck and he sees on this persimmon leaf um, a fall webworm caterpillar just hanging out on this uh, persimmon leaf and he starts looking around, it's really tiny, starts looking around, sees a bunch of egg masses. Uh, we start seeing adults and it turns out they're all over this tree. And I actually, at Sifwick um, last year in Savannah, got a tattoo of a persimmon leaf with a fall webworm caterpillar on it because of how much this one little guy on a leaf has like just totally changed my um, career path in a pretty short amount of time. Um, but anyways, he, he sees these egg masses, these caterpillars, we're looking around at them and, and we're like, you know, wouldn't it be uh, interesting if we tried to get these guys to eat calorie pair? Because we've been talking about calorie pair, how awful it is. Let's just take them back to the lab and give them some calorie pair and just see if they eat it or not. And so that was about a year and three months ago. And now you're about to see the list of all of the things that we're doing in calorie pair that has just exploded from this one little leaf with a fall webworm on it. So before I really get into what we've been doing in calorie pair, we have to first address what is invasional meltdown. Um, it's in my title, so we have to get that out of the way first off. Um, and this idea is actually pretty recent in the grand scheme of invasion ecology hypotheses. And essentially, it's just saying, it's just saying that uh, invasive species beget more invasive species. Um, the driving mechanisms behind this are variable and highly debated. Uh, my personal opinion is looking at invasive species as their own form of disturbance. But um, yesterday or Tuesday, uh, when I met with Ellen's group, we were talking about how there's this big debate on whether invasive species constitute a disturbance. Um, so I'm sure everybody's got their own definition and uh, their own opinions on that. So that's just my personal definition of invasional meltdown is uh, invasive species essentially acting as its own form of disturbance. We know that disturbed areas are more invasible by other invasive species and so we kind of have this spiral uh, of a meltdown going from uh, a nice native, uh, very diverse community to a less diverse community made up of a lot of invasive species. So the quintessential example of this is the brown tree snake in Guam. Um, if you're unfamiliar with that example, the brown tree snake was introduced on military equipment to Guam shortly after the end of World War II. And um, we have on the left-hand side a pretty standard vertebrate food web of Guam before the invasion of brown tree snakes. So we see we do have a few um, non-native species but on the right hand side, we see an invaded food web um, with more invasive species. Uh, their presence has resulted in the direct extinction of some native species from Guam. And we can see that everything leads back to this brown tree snake. So even our one carnivore that we had on the island before the invasion of the brown tree snake is now eaten by the brown tree snake. Um, so there's a lot of driving mechanisms that go into this with shifted phenology and, and all kinds of stuff. We won't get into that, but um, this is just a really good example of invasional meltdown uh, from one species. And so we have seen this in plants as well, especially uh, Chinese privet. 
So the uh, journal that, or the article that I suggested for the journal club the other day uh, was Loeb et al. from 2014, looking at Chinese privet in relation to earthworms. And so what this paper says is that uh, the leaf litter from Chinese privet changes the soil pH. Um, it puts all of this additional available nitrogen into the system and creates a situation that is uh, very habitable for invasive earthworms and not very habitable for native earthworms. And they found that when you remove Chinese privet from the system, the natives can actually recover um, and get in higher proportions than the invas uh, invasive earthworms. And so there's a whole slew of other effects by Chinese privet on butterflies and bees and uh, wood boring beetles and all kinds of other stuff. But the um, earthworms aspect is really the, um, the bellwether of the invasional meltdown from Chinese privet. And so we started thinking, is this happening in calorie pair? Observationally, we can uh, kind of conclude that it is in our own minds, but you have to have data to back up um, ideas like that. And a big idea like invasional meltdown requires a lot of big data. Um, and so calorie pair, we started looking at a couple years ago. Um, Pyrus caloriana is the species and what you're most familiar with is the cultivar Bradford probably. Uh, there's several other cultivars, Chanticleer and, and some others that are pretty regularly planted, but Bradford was planted very widespread across the United States um, from the 60s all the way into the 90s. So some of those older neighborhoods, you'll find uh, quite a bit of Bradford pear planted, just like now you see um, red maples as the standard landscape tree in new subdivisions. So at the time when calorie pear was brought over, um, it was initially brought over for reclamation of old uh, ag fields that had been decimated out west. And uh, the idea was, here's this fruit tree. We might be able to turn it into an economic species. It grows in a wide range of environments, grows in all types of soils. You can find it in a wet site just as readily as you can find it on a rocky outcropping. Um, and it'll grow just as well in both of those scenarios. And so um, in all of that exploration, this Bradford uh, cultivar was created. So then it was brought over and planted again for the horticulture industry. And initially it was thought that it was sterile because Bradford cannot cross with Bradford. Um, unfortunately, now we know that it can cross with virtually any other uh, pyrus, so any of the Asian species that we have. Um, we do have native pyrus. So when that happens, we get this uh, really thorny, shrubby tree um, that's very painful to work in, and I have a lot of people working in it right now. Um, here is my, one of my undergrads, Alex. So she's about five foot two. So this calorie pear is about seven feet tall and it was uh, in its third growing season. Um, you can really easily see the growth scars on these things. And so you can see on here, growth scar, growth scar. So that's two and a half years of growth was over seven feet tall. And so we find these things in managed forests all over the place, rights of way, um, roadsides, you know, the classic, disturbed habitats where we find a slew of invasive plants. So this is an example of uh, invaded longleaf pine forest. This is in Columbia, South Carolina, which is about two and a half hours um, southeast of Clemson. And each one of these probably has two or three stems coming off of it. Each one of those stems has those really thorny branches um, that not only hurt when you're walking through them, um, but also can pop tires on logging equipment. Um, so Dave Coyle has had multiple phone calls from loggers who have spent thousands of dollars uh, replacing tires on their logging equipment. Because you can see these thorns are over two inches long. Um, and they're not like honey locust thorns or black locust thorns where they'll snap. These things are stout and they will 
very easily puncture your shoes or your tires if you're driving over them. So, uh, you know, incidentally and observationally, we see this stuff everywhere. We know that it has to be having effects on the ecosystem, but we don't know what it's doing to arthropod herbivores. We don't know anything about its leaf nutrition, um, secondary metabolites. We don't know how any of these effect on arthropods is going to affect other trophic levels. So what happens to birds? What happens to wildlife? Um, how is it competing, at least in our managed forests, with uh, economic timber? Um, so these were all the questions that we started asking ourselves, and this is when it went, went kind of from a side project and started ballooning a little bit. And so uh, one of the things that we wanted to look at was driving mechanisms behind the spread of calorie pair. Um, because it's been here for a long time, and you know we frequently see lag times of introductions of species that are very low level and then they uh, rise exponentially. So that's not a new concept, but what, what is it that's causing calorie pair to become established and spread the way that it is now? So because it grows in this wide range of environments, uh, lots of different soil conditions, et cetera, um, we were thinking that it's probably something biotic that's causing um, this spread and allowing it to establish and become so prevalent. And one of the most popular um, invasion ecology hypotheses is the enemy release hypothesis. For those of you who are not super familiar with that, um, it essentially says that natural enemies in the native range of whatever pest you're talking about um, is the main form of population regulation and population control. Typically, we see specialists as being most important in these scenarios. And so uh, this makes sense because generalists require a wide breadth of hosts. They don't have the ability to metabolize these secondary metabolites or whatever toxins are present in that host. And so they need a wide range of things to feed on. Um, whereas specialists can focus on one species or maybe one genus. So to look at this, we initially did some feeding assays. This is where the fall webworm comes into play. Um, and so we did this with choice and no choice experiments, and we did it on calorie pair plus four natives per species. Following the feeding assays, we also did canopy surveys to look for herbivores and predators and all the other uh, feeding guilds that you would find in the canopy of these trees. So our first species that we did was fall webworm. And my N over here is that it's native and G is generalist. Uh, so this was our native generalist species. We also found, or I found actually in my backyard, this photo is on a cherry tree that I cut down in my backyard, <laughs> found a bunch of Eastern tent caterpillars. Um, so that is our native specialist. And then uh, everybody has a plethora of Japanese beetles in the summer. So that was our other, uh, that was our generalist from the native range of calorie pear. So what this looked like was a Petri dish with five leaf discs, or in the case of Japanese beetles, because these guys are so big and so stout, they actually got whole leaves um, for their part in the experiment. And so for the choice test, each one of these is its own species. So we would have calorie pair, a primary host, two secondary hosts, and then a non-host as a pseudo control. And then in our no choice, each one of these would be the same species. So one rep looked like a dish with five different species and then five dishes each with one species. So the way that that played out, persimmon is where we found our fall webworm. So that was the primary host. Uh, we also used bocker nut, hickory, and sweet gum. And then tulip poplar, nothing really likes tulip poplar. So that was a pretty good um, non-host option for all three of our uh, insects. So we also used black cherry, hawthorn, and Carolina rose for our eastern tent caterpillar. And then uh, black raspberries where we got most of our uh, Japanese beetles. And then again, we use mocker nut hickory and red maple, but it's actually kind of hard to find something that Japanese beetle doesn't eat. Seems like it eats everything. So that was kind of difficult to, 
to work in a non-host for them. So this is our little fall webworm up here. Um, and what we saw was exactly what you would expect for a generalist caterpillar. So lots of feeding in the choice test, they fed on everything. Um, and then going from cho choice to no choice, we saw a significant reduction in feeding across the board, except you'll notice for our non-host, which I think it was just trying to get any kind of nutrition it could and calorie pair. Um, and so we expect generalists to reduce their feeding in a no choice scenario, because like I said, they need this wide breadth of hosts and when they don't have it, they reduce their feeding significantly. So even though we saw a little bit of an uptick in our secondary host, overall they still fed less in our no choice experiments versus our choice experiments. Um, and so this moderate feeding on calorie pair by our native generalist is going to become very important in a minute. Um, so that's the main takeaway from this part. This is our Eastern tent caterpillar. And again, acted pretty well what, how we would expect. Um, they have the ability to digest these toxins. So they fed heavily on the primary and secondary hosts in a choice scenario and in a non-choice scenario. Um, the difference being that their feeding of calorie pair went down substantially between choice and no choice experiments. So when given a choice, they fed on calorie um, almost as much as they did their native species. And you could think of this in field scenarios as like a early infestation versus a late infestation. So um, in an early infestation, maybe we still have some native species present, uh, but in a later infestation, it's probably more of a monoculture and we only see calorie pair there. And so in this monoculture scenario, we still have feeding, but it's very moderate. We don't have heavy feeding by the specialist, um, which if you'll remember is important in the enemy release hypothesis. And then for our Japanese beetle, again, very similar to what we would expect for a generalist in that they fed a lot in the choice experiments and not a lot in the no choice experiments. And their feeding of calorie pair, even though um, they're from the same range, did go down. Um, and they're still feeding a little bit, very little to moderate feeding on calorie in both scenarios. So after we finished our feeding assays, we did canopy surveys. So we did this in the spring and the summer. And then actually, we just did this yesterday. I don't have those data yet. Um, but for those of you unfamiliar with the beet sheet, it's literally just a canvas sheet that's in a square and you can take a branch or in this case, the whole tree and you beat it against the canvas. And so anything that is in that canopy falls out onto the sheet and then you can collect it and identify it later. So we did this 10 on 10 different branches or 10 times per plant. And then we had 10 plants per species. And so we did this with calorie plus four of our natives that they fed on the most. Um, so that ended up being persimmon, uh, mockernut hickory, black cherry, and sweet gum. And what we found so far is that calorie pear has the lowest species richness, the second lowest Shannon index, um, so the second lowest index of biodiversity, they also had the lowest proportion of predators and the lowest proportion of herbivores. So our abundance really did not differ very much between calorie pair and our natives. But what we were finding on our natives was things like aphids and scale insects and spiders and um, a lot of native species that fit into all of these different feeding guilds. And what we found on calorie pair most often was things like European earwigs and uh, bark lice. So we found things that were feeding on maybe the lichen or nearby detritus, but not on the calorie itself. Um, and also not on the herbivores on calorie. Did not find a lot of predators. So bringing this back to our driving mechanisms, uh, since we know that calorie grows pretty much everywhere, we saw moderate generalist feeding and significantly reduced specialist feeding, 
um, plus the lack of diversity and lack of herbivores on calorie parrot in our canopy surveys really supports this idea that they're being released from their natural enemies and that that is at least one driving mechanism behind the spread of calorie pair. Um, so by no means is this the only driving mechanism and we're looking at other avenues as well, but we do see quite a bit of evidence to support this idea of the ERH in our calorie pair system. And you're like, okay, that's cool. You said that you were going to talk about invasional meltdown. You haven't talked about invasional meltdown yet. So what about invasional meltdown? So we're also looking at spread of calorie pair into managed forests, specifically managed pine forests. And we're looking at this from the angle of sand composition um, in terms of species that are present, as well as canopy closure. Uh, we're in the very early stages of that so far. Um, so at the moment, all we really have are species lists of what we're finding in the infested versus uninfested stands. So you'll notice that in our uninfested stands, we have a lot of natives, eastern red cedar and dogwood, uh, locust, sweet gum, water oak, lots of different uh, native species in those stands versus our infested stands where we have a lot of Chinese privet, winter creeper, which is another invasive, uh, but we do also see some natives in those stands as well. So we can't be sure whether these invasives are allowing the spread of calorie into the system, or if the presence of calorie is allowing the spread of these other invasives, um, or how those interactions are playing out. We just know at the moment that we find more invasive species where we find calorie pair in managed pine forests. And you're like, okay, <laughs> so you still haven't talked about invasional meltdown. Um, and this is where the story gets super fun. So we're also looking at leaf litter. And Ellen actually collected some leaf litter for us in the spring. And um, she's going to collect some leaf litter again for us this fall. We're going to go out and do our leaf litter collections probably in the next three weeks or so. Um, but We've got people from, yeah, Ellen from Kentucky. We've got um, a colleague, Mike Scavarla, who runs the Arthropod Museum at Penn State. He's been collecting leaf litter for us, a colleague at Mississippi State, um, and then uh, all around the state of South Carolina and actually a little bit in North Carolina as well. So we're covering a pretty wide um, range of calorie pair in our leaf litter collections. And we're doing this twice a year, spring and fall, in uh, sites that are invaded with calorie pair, as well as sites that are uninvaded. And we try to make our uninvaded sites as little um, invasive plants as possible, which is really hard to find um, stands that are close to a city center and in some kind of residential area. Um, but don't have any invasive plants. So I don't know that we've been able to get sites um, that match up habitat wise, but don't have any invasive plants, but we're trying really hard. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's super difficult. So we use that leaf litter sifter to sift out the bugs in our leaf litter. And then this is Alex again, one of my undergrads. She's putting the uh, leaf litter into a Berlazi funnel. Um, and so we leave them in that Berlazi funnel for about five days and uh, sort through them and identify afterwards. And this is an example of what we find in our calorie pair sites versus our native sites. So up here is a native site. You can see we've got a lot of, we've got different centipedes, different millipedes. Um, we've got several different kinds of carabids and weevils and native ants and spiders. Um, here's even more millipedes over to the right hand side. <laughs> and here's our calorie site. So only at the calorie sites do we find things like cockroaches. And only at the calorie sites do we find things like European earwigs um, and snails and uh, red imported fire ants. We find a lot of red imported fire ants. So 
in our leaf litter, what we're finding so far is that our abundance and diversity doesn't seem to differ, but our species composition differs significantly. So not only um, do we find different communities, but the communities that we find in calorie pair tend to be filled with invasive species and uh, species in different feeding guilds than what we find in our native sites. And um, our calorie sites are in these urban areas. And so you might think, well, maybe this is just a uh, side effect of being you know, at the grocery store down the street. But our native sites are in very similar habitats. These are sites that maybe were um, recently next to a recently cleared site. And so they're not necessarily overrun with invasive plants yet. So we are seeing this effect that where we have calorie pair, we also have more invasive arthropods versus native sites that do not have calorie pair. Um, so we are starting to see some evidence that um, at least the presence of calorie pair does something to the system that invites in all of these other invasive arthropods. So then what does this mean for invasional meltdown? What does this mean for ecosystem health? Um, this is where it really started to balloon and turned into, okay, we need a PhD student to work on this um, because you know every time you ask one question and you do the experiment for it, you end up asking more questions than what you've answered. And so that's kind of the step that we're at right now. So, so far, we, uh, we have evidence that calorie pair is a pretty poor food source for arthropod herbivores. Um, we see that we don't really have a whole lot of herbivores in our calorie pair canopy. We have a lot of omnivores and a lot of detritivores, but not a lot of things that are actually feeding on calorie pair itself. Um, we think that this is related to the low abundance of predators because um, it would make sense that if we don't have a lot of stuff that's actively feeding on calorie, maybe these are um, transient things that are there because of an ephemeral detritus resource and they're not actually feeding on the foliage itself. So if we don't have a lot of things that are there permanently, we wouldn't expect to have a lot of predators um, without that food source. So I do have uh, an undergrad who's working on, <clears throat> excuse me, a bird project, looking at insectivorous birds visiting calorie pear versus other uh, similar natives like persimmon and black cherry. They tend to also um, go into these disturbed habitats. And so we tend to find them very frequently along roadsides and stuff like that. I would love to look at the impacts of this on small mammals. I am not a mammal person in any way, shape or form. Oh, I guess I have three cats. And so that's the way that I'm a mammal person. But outside of my three cats, I really am just not um, on the small mammal train. So if anybody watching right now has ideas of how we could look at impacts of calorie pair and the arthropod herbivores on small mammals, I'm all ears. Um, and then finally, what kind of impacts does calorie pair have on native plants? So what we're doing this fall and also next spring is uh, collecting some leaves from calorie pair in the area and then looking for secondary metabolites. Um, we're also gonna be collecting roots to look for allelopathic chemicals. So if you'll remember that specialist, um, our Eastern tent caterpillar, reducing its feeding on calorie pair really strongly suggests that there's a novel secondary metabolite in the leaf that's preventing um, something that should be able to metabolize or another rosaceous species from being able to metabolize those leaves. Um, the root allelopathy is very common among invasive plants that we have established in the US. And um, just anecdotally, when we find a site that's got a lot of calorie pair, especially if the calorie pair is pretty mature, we do tend to see kind of a dead zone around uh, the base of the tree um, extending for a little bit. You don't find hardly anything else growing around it. And so there's some 
observational anecdotal evidence um, for that root allelopathy. So we're going to be looking at that as well. Um, this is Alex. She's also looking at wood borers. So what she has done for an undergraduate research initiative project is collect um, calorie pear twigs along with eight other species. Um, so black cherry, she's also doing some other invasives like mimosa and princess tree. And she, uh, we put them along this forest edge. Uh, she had three different time points. So she collected these after a month and then three months and then six months. And so she is looking at what wood borers go to calorie pair and these other invasives versus our native uh, species. And um, we're also looking at pollinators of calorie pear with the idea that if pollinators are attracted to calorie pear over our natives, then we might see some indirect effects. And um, honeybees are also non-native. And so uh, that's another area of interest for me. And so, like I said, I have an undergraduate who's looking at birds that visit calorie pear. Um, I guess I wasn't really thinking when her and I were talking about this, and she wasn't either, um, that birds come out really early. They come out before the sun does. <laughs> so her project has been a lot of getting up at four o'clock in the morning to go set up video cameras and um, listen to bird calls. So I'm now a birder, which I never thought I would be. Um, and again, the small mammal surveys, always looking for ways to do that. Um, if anybody in here has any ideas, I would love to hear them. And then finally, we're continuing to look at this idea of canopy closure in uh, calorie pair spread. So far, it looks like we have more, ca uh, more calorie pair in stands with less canopy closure. So it might be that light is our limiting resource here um, or competition with natives or competition with other invasives because we do find things like Chinese privet and wisteria and all these other things in uh, some of these sites. We're also looking at stand biodiversity. So there are um, several invasion ecology hypotheses that look at the relatedness between um, species that inhabit a site that's invasible versus sites that are not invasible. So um, I mentioned on my species list of our invaded sites that we do still find rosaceous natives like black cherry and um, persimmon. And so uh, we're interested to know, does the phylogenetic relationship between the species that are in these stands make a difference in terms of calorie pair being introduced and being able to establish and spread and cause those impacts? Um, and then, uh, finally, like I said, species composition, what actually is making up the stand, um, what our species richness looks like, what our biodiversity looks like in those areas. And so this was uh, partially done through a creative inquiry program, which is an undergraduate research program. Um, and then Sarah is my new PhD student. She just started this fall. Um, and then I've got you know, several other people who have helped find sites and collect data and all that good stuff. Um, 